Shalom, this is Rabbi David Vasquez, and we have a great show for you today. Today, we have a special guest who's going to answer the question, can we hasten the coming of Moshiach? So invite your friends, sit back and relax as we start the show right now. Shalom Mishpuchan Havarim, this is your host Rabbi David Vasquez and welcome once again to Walking in the Footsteps of the Moshiach. Today we have uh, with us a well-known rabbi, doctor in Messianic Judaism, instructor of Jewish history and a director of Jewish theology. Our guest today is Rabbi Dr. Stephen Bernstein. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. Rabbi Steve was born on Lag Omar, 1958 in Ann Harbor, Michigan, but was raised in Gainesville, Florida. The son of two University of Florida professors, Steve excelled in the sciences in school. In addition to his normal academic studies, Steve also pursued his Jewish education, studying with many rabbis and professors of Judaica studies from the university, including visiting rabbis such as Abraham Joshua Heschel and Shlomo Karlebach. In the 1970s, Steve moved his family to Jerusalem, where his parents became visiting professors at Hebrew University. In addition to continuing his academic studies while in Israel, Steve served in the Gadna Division of the Israeli Def Defense Forces. He also did volunteer work on kibbutzim with Shirut Liumi, with Magin David Adom, and various archaeological digs all over Israel. On returning to the U.S., Steve entered Duke University. He pursued both sciences and Judaic studies, studying first century Judea under Dr. Eric Myers and historical Judaism under Dr. Kalman Bland. He finished his degree at the University of the West Florida with a major in philosophy and religious studies and New Testament studies under Reverend Dr. William Mountcastle. After college, Steve became a financial advisor and investment consultant. He worked with Payne Weber for 14 years and earned the Chartered Financial Consultant designation from the American College in Bryn Mawr, PA. He joined Raymond James in 2001 and retired in 2019. Steve was given his first simcha in 2010. Since then, he has been the rabbi of Aidat Haderech Messianic Synagogue in Fort Myers, Florida, which is affiliated with the UMJC. He is an instructor of Jewish history and Yeshivat Shuva, where he is the director of theology. Rabbi Steve received his doctorate in Messianic Judaism in 2020 from Shuva College of Messianic Judaism, and he lives in Estero, Flora with his wife, Roni. Please let us welcome Rabbi Dr. Stephen A. Bernstein. Shalom, Stephen, and welcome to our shalom, program. Shalom. How are God you? bless you, my brother. I am doing well. It's, um, it's a nice day here in the city of Philadelphia. I'm sure it's very nice out there in outer space where you're from. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, the, the cosmic overlook, we like it. Man, I mean, just be careful with the sun glare. I may burn you a little bit there. <laughs> Amen. And we we thank you so much for joining us today in the show. And uh, it's uh, it's an uh, it's an honor to have you here with us today and sharing a little bit about who you are and sharing uh, with us this study concerning can we hasten the coming of Moshiach? And um, so, first question I have for you today is: Can you tell us and the viewers a little bit about your background, how you came to the Moshiach? 
Uh, yeah, I um, I grew up uh, in a in, um, fairly observant uh, Jewish family in uh, in Gainesville, and uh, so in my studies, I, I, I was I was very very uh, uh, amongst my peer group considered learned as far as Judaism was concerned. The first Talmud I studied was uh, uh, just post bar mitzvah, so. Wow. You know, we're 13 years old here, you know, because we've been through Tanakh a lot and it was time. So we we started. And so with that kind of background, I uh, uh, I, I, I really wasn't, um, I didn't have a good taste in my mouth about Christianity. Let me put it that way. Gotcha. Um, I started dating a girl <laughs> who was... Uh, uh, very active in the in uh, I guess the Baptist uh, uh, student union there at the uh, University of Florida, and uh, had some fairly interesting experiences with her that got my attention. But ultimately, I came to Yeshua with a vision, and I, I've I've actually in in uh, my travels I. I I found that many, many Jewish people that come to uh, Yeshua do come through a, a vision, something supernatural, mm -hmm. as opposed to being simply convinced with arguments. Correct. And uh, uh, so with this vision, it happened and uh, there was no, there's no denying it. There's, <laughs> right, there's, right, right. It's not, not something it could be talked out of. It just, it is. And I have. That happened in 1980, and I've been uh, uh, trying to walk in the footsteps of Mashiach ever since. Amen. So when you met this Christian girl, first of all, how did your parents say you're dating a girl who's not Jewish? Did they ever say that uh, to you? They, 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 they didn't know. They, this was, uh, this, uh, <laughs> this was a little need-to-know basis, huh? Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to give my mother a heart attack. So, I, no, I didn't. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. That, this is not something that is generally encouraged. <laughs> oh, correct, correct. That's what I was asking. So then when you met her, of course, you, you fell for this, this girl. And um, she was introducing you to, the, um, to Christ, to, to Jesus. You as yeah. being a Jew who didn't believe in Yeshua, and you had this supernatural vision experience with, with him. You know, did you recognize who he was when he, when, he, when he, I guess, appeared to you or in the vision or however he came to you? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there was no question that I recognized him and who he was, but the, 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 the way that the, the girl played into it was, was kind of interesting. We were taking a walk one evening and rather than trying to beat me in the head with a, a Bible, which she was aware of. My background didn't really understand the implications of it. She didn't know what it was. Just mm -hmm. you know that I grew up a, a, a nice Jewish boy, but uh, and she had no experience with Judaism whatsoever. She had mm -hmm. no clue, uh, which was okay. Um, and she was going through interesting times as far as her faith is concerned. She grew up Baptist. Her father is a deacon in the in the Baptist church, and she was rebelling. So. Wow. Uh, so she 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 was uh, uh, decided she was going to go to a Pentecostal church. <laughs> if so, anything, a Pentecostal church, right? Wow. Right. So, you know, th this is a, I, I guess, a big no, no. I, I'm not. <laughs> so so she was uh, so she was trying to explain to me what the difference was because uh, I'm absolutely clueless about this. She said, she said "Well, we we do um, uh, speaking in tongues," and I'm like, "Yeah." What's, what's that? And so she explained a little bit and I said, okay, let's hear it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, no, no, it doesn't work like that. We have to pray first. I said, okay, you know, prayer mm -hmm, is good. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. We could pray. So we prayed for a little bit. And then, and then now understand this girl has no knowledge of Judaism whatsoever. Mm -hmm, right. So uh, we pray for a little bit and then is she looks at me and she says, uh, Yit Gadal Vit Gadash Shemir Rabbah. 
Mm. And she keeps going. Wow. And so if you're Jewish, you know, this is the Kaddish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And I said, so you're Jewish. You've been to synagogues. She said, no. Wow. But you're saying the Kaddish. She said, the what? <laughs> wow. She had no idea what she was saying or what, what she said or anything. Yeah, but the Ruach HaKodesh did. Yeah. And, and I was like, hmm. well, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, so that was an attention gap wow. for me. Yeah. It certainly didn't convince me of anything. But right. it, it, it was one of those things that, uh, okay, let's have, let's have a look at this Yeshua guy. And uh, then probably two, three months later, I had this vision in the middle of the night and uh, there was, there was no denying it. And that was that. Amen. Amen. And uh, you know, when you, I guess when you first had this encounter um, with Yeshua and you realized that he was the Jewish Messiah, I mean, how did, how did that make you think of all these years of learning, you know, uh, what you've learned in the past prior to this? I, I've, you know, the, most Jewish people in this country um, grow up with a rather agnostic view. If you come out of the reform set, and that was not me. Mm-hmm. I was, I very much believed in God and very much believed in uh, God having a, a purpose for us. Uh, sometimes I ran away from it. Sometimes I ran, went with it, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As, as a human being, you, you go through these ebbs and flows. Of That's right. So, this it just counted to me as part of it. It was like, okay, what's next? This is this is this is fascinating. This is not something that I had, uh, was planning for or even thinking about. But here I'm faced with the reality. And uh, okay, how do we, where do we go from here? <laughs> and, and so now, since you you've you know been serving Yeshua for all these years. And you've been able to, I guess, you know, in, in Judaism, look at it, the things in Judaism and, and look at things with Yeshua and kind of like put them together. Now, you, have you, do you realize you have a much greater picture than you had before? Uh, yeah, I, I, I do have a, a, a better picture, and, but it's a bit confusing. Um, not necessarily to me, but to a lot of folks. Right. Because uh, when you come from a background like this, and I had been studying uh, first century Judaism uh, under academic, yeah, from an mm-hmm. academic point of view for, for many, many years at this point also. And you get to the point, and you look at things in the New Testament, you look at the gospels and you kind of look over your shoulder and say, these people have no idea what's going on here in the text. Right, <laughs> this, right. Is fasc- this is fascinating stuff. This is right smack dab in the middle of huge discussions and arguments that are going on historically within the context yes. of, of the times. And, and they have, people don't, they have no idea. They mm-hmm. don't know what's going on. They don't know how brilliant Yeshua really was. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, amen. So now that you, you, know, you found the Lord and you, and you see all these things that are coming to you, how did your family take this, this news when they oh, found out? Um. My mother is my mother, and, and she loved, loved me greatly. And, uh, you know, whatever it was, as long as I didn't kill somebody, it was okay. Amen, um, amen. And uh, my, my father is a different story. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel you. My same thing, my family, my grandmother kind of like, eh, show me away. You know, they didn't want anything to do with me. But uh, she still loved me, but she was like watching me, you know, making sure that I was in the right path. And, um, well, Baruch Hashem, my mother became a believer before. She a man, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Yeah, my grandmother, um, she was a survivor of the Holocaust. And uh, mm. and I believe I was told that she became a believer before she passed away. Mm. So, you know, I, 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 uh, I hope and I pray that was the case. Um, but I, I know that she went through a lot of things and she wasn't always all there. You know, yeah. her mind and stuff like that. But Ruch Hashem, you know, praise God that that God has brought you to the kingdom of Mashiach, and that you are instructing other people how to find this this Jewish Messiah. Amen. Amen. And uh, and you're and you've been married to this girl you met. Is it the same girl? No, no, that no? That, uh, that ended up not working out. Um, but uh, I 
married now uh, to uh, Roni. We've, we've been happily married for uh, 12 years now. Amen. Praise God. A little bit that God always provides a helpmate for someone. Amen. And it's such a blessing. Praise God. Well, uh, Dr. Bernstein, um, we want to get into this fascinating topic that you and I were discussing the other day. And um, can we hasten the coming of Moshiach? So, Dr. Bernstein, you know, this is a question that many believers in Moshiach and both Christians and Jewish may be asking themselves right now. Is there a way we can make Yeshua come before the time he was appointed to come? That's the question. The way the question is phrased, and it's, it's very common mm -hmm. to phrase the question this way, mm -hmm. is very misleading. Yes. Okay. So let, let's back things up a little bit mm -hmm. uh, and to, to understand that. When we talk about God and God's perspective, the sages talk about God's perspective all the time versus right. our perspective. God's perspective is, is outside of time and space. Mm -hmm. And this is, it takes some getting used to, to be able to grasp all of the implications of Hashem's perspective being outside of time and space. That's right. Right. It's not that something is going to happen. There is no going. There is no such thing as then. There's no sequence. There's no causation. There's an eternal simultaneity. So can something happen before it's supposed to happen? And the answer is the question makes absolutely no sense from a perspective of outside of time and space. Right. Everything simply is. Right. Right. From the, the uh, uh, birth of Adam which we're, we're studying, you know, we're in that, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. place in the Torah's, Torah cycle now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To, to, to the last trumpet. Yes. Right? And mm -hmm. everything in between, Yeshua is coming, Yeshua is second come, all of it, all of it simultaneous from Hashem's point of view. So can we hasten anything? Well, hasten is not something, uh, a term that really has any meaning from beyond time and space. Now, we live within time and space. Right. Right. And there's an aspect of who we are, an aspect of our soul, if you will, our nefesh, for those of you that know, mm -hmm. it, that, that is within time and space. So, yes, we have causation. We have uh, a, a, a time that, that, that stretches on and sequence and all of these things that we talk about, all of these things that our language uh, is structured, assuming. So the terminology works that way. Right. So. There is a connection between this existence that we perceive, time and space, mm -hmm. and outside of time and space, which is God's perspective. And so how these things overlap is really what the question is. Yes. It's not really, can this happen in a way that God wasn't expecting? Right? We don't mm -hmm. have things happening. You know, we don't catch God by surprise, you know? No, uh, no, no. Take Chava, Chava gets the fruit and, and, and she eats it. And God goes, oh, my gosh, I didn't see that coming. No, it, it didn't. <laughs> I, he was didn't, sleeping. He didn't, he, didn't catch, he didn't catch it. But no, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all of these things are, 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 are known to Hashem. And so the time that he actually has Yeshua returning, it's not that it's predetermined. It's that he already knows it. Right, right. And that's mostly, you know, basically what a lot of believers say, both Christian, both Messianic, but you do find from time to time within both, you may find people saying, like, for example, I, I was hearing someone the other day, I think it was yesterday, as a matter of fact, as a Christian evangelist, and he was saying, yes, you know, the, the coming of Yeshua, it's, it could be any moment, any time, you know, uh, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be tonight, you know, and that's within the Christian perspective. Then you have the Messianic perspective that believes it was, it's an appointed time by God for it to happen. And then most Messianics, I wouldn't say all, but most Messianics believe that it will happen on a Jewish holiday. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. See, the idea here is, 
and this is again something that that was very natural to me coming out of my Jewish background. Mm-hmm. That all of existence, the entire plan, is not something that's imposed on humanity. Because God doesn't do this to us. Rather, we're in partnership with Him. Right. He created us so that we would be in partnership with Him. Right. And so, there's a lot of things that happen uh, that are affected by us even though from a perspective outside of time and space, things don't change, but there is an effect. I'll give you an example, right? We just finished Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. And one of the tougher parts of Yom Kippur, so you're getting to the afternoon, uh, you you get to the Mincha service in the afternoon and you know, you've got Naila coming and Mm -hmm. this is, as a kid, you're dying already. I mean, you know, you're 14 years old. By that time you're you're out. You are. (laughs) Right, you're, you're, you're not used to this. If you get older, it's easier to fast. Mm-hmm. But you get to the mincha, and you, and you study. The, the, the sages have a study in the book of Jonah. Mm-hmm. It's a very fascinating topic. You look at Jonah, and God tells Jonah, says, look, you're going to go to Nineveh. You're going to go to Nineveh. You're going to tell the people that they need to repent, because this is something they need to do. And Jonah's reaction is classic. Jonah's reaction is, leave me out of it. Yeah. Look, I know it's going to happen. You're going to make me go do this. I'm going to go to Ninda. I'm going to put on the sandwich board, repent. The end is mm-hmm. nigh. I'll walk up and down and downtown. They're going to repent. You're going to forget You're them. not going to destroy them, like you said. Just <laughs> right, do right. it without me. I don't need to be part of this. Yeah. And God says, no. And Jonah says, fine, I'm out of here. And we find out very quickly, you can run, but you can't hide. Correct. And, and so Jonah eventually goes to Ninveh, puts on the sandwich board, he walks up and down. And I can just imagine his attitude, repent or you'll be destroyed. You know, but people listen. Yeah. They listen. They make teshuva. They repent. Yes. And then what happens? What happens is the prophecy doesn't come true. Right? There's mm-hmm. this prophecy. Jonah's given this prophecy mm-hmm. that the people of Nineveh are going to be destroyed. Yeah. And then the prophecy doesn't come true. Why doesn't the prophecy come true? And first of all, that in itself is 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 a mind blower, particularly for people of a Christian mindset. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great. If it's a prophecy, it's got to come true. That's sort of the definition of prophecy, right? Right. Well, it's not, but that's okay. We can get to that another time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so the people repent, and therefore the prophecy doesn't come true, mm-hmm. and and everything works. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is something that we need to be aware of. The, 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 the wonderfulness of the whole idea of teshuva, of returning to God. Now, this idea is all through the Jewish world in the time of, of Yeshua and his disciples. Correct. Now, we get that we are in partnership with God all through everything. The idea of the coming of a Messiah is all through the Jewish world at this time. Mm-hmm. But everybody's looking at the Romans, saying, "Look, we got to get rid of these guys. That's what the Messiah is going." So, in a way, they miss the boat. Mm-hmm. They do, and they don't. Now, Peter, uh, in his second letter, says something that's very interesting that we we need to pay attention to. Yeah, Peter's talking about the end times. And how everything is going to go awfully bad. Right. It's gonna. It's not going to be a fun place to be. And he says in in verse eleven, chapter three, verse eleven, in his second letter, so since everything is going to be destroyed like this, what kind of people should you be? And he says you should lead holy and godly lives. Mm-hmm. Now, a holy life, a life that is kadosh, we know that something that is kadosh is separate, right? It's separated for God. So a holy and godly life is a life that is separated for God. Right. 
And then he finishes the sentence. He says, as you wait for the day of the Lord, hastening his coming. Hmm. As you wait for the day of the Lord, hastening his coming. So there's something about living a holy life that hastens the day of his coming. That's right. Okay. So if you, if you can have this effect, and we already know you can have an effect, we know from Jonah, uh-huh. right? If you make teshuva, you can have an effect. Right. So here we have Peter reminding everybody, this is not a huge revelation. This is a reminder. Uh-huh. If you lead a holy and godly life, you can hasten the day of the Lord. Uh-huh. Okay. So the only question left is, what's a holy and godly life? All right. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, you hear this and um, a lot of times people say, well, this is just coming from, you know, that we had the Shah is coming from the new covenant is not found within Judaism, but yet it is. It is found, oh, in goodness, Judaism. It's found within Judaism. Yes, absolutely. The Hasidic masters are all over this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Hasidic master. Why do you follow the Tzaddik? You, know, you read the read, read the writings of Rabbi Nathan. Yes. Right. Why Why do you follow the Tzaddik? You read further back. You go all the way back to the writings of, of Chaim Vital, who was a, the, the student of the great Ari. That's right. And he's talking all the time about the Tzaddik. Why do you follow the Tzaddik? What's a Tzaddik and why do you follow him? The Tzaddik is someone who does what? Mitzvot. That's right. That's right. right. He fills his life with mitzvot and he does a good job of it. So much so that we should try to copy him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, there, right. there are many theories within the Orthodox community, of course, um, especially the, uh, the Lubavitch group, you know, concerning what they believe the, the coming of Moshiach will bring, you know, and some of them do believe that, you know, that when all the souls have been used up in the bank, in Shamaim, you know, that'll bring the coming of Moshiach. And, uh, you know, so you hear a lot of this within the Orthodox community, believe it or not, they're not too far away from what most believers believe concerning the Moshiach and his coming. And it's unfortunate that we don't know, as believers, people that are out there that are watching possibly this program right now, don't know too much about this, that none of this is all new. All this stuff comes from the time of old. You know, it's been going around for for many, many thousands of years concerning the belief of the Moshiach. And um, do you believe, you know, you, you see this a lot today, especially in Yerushalayim. You see a lot of Orthodox Jews claiming Moshiach, Moshiach, come, Moshiach is here now. So do you believe right now where we're at in this time? So we're talking about time and space. In this time now, do you believe that the stage is set for the coming of the Moshiach? Yes. Absolutely. 100%. Amen. The problem is... Mm-hmm. There's always and a problem. I think the stage has been set for the last two thousand years. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay. Well, so, so, do I think Mashiach is coming? Do I think Mashiach is coming soon? And the answer is yes, but I'm not willing to say what soon means. Correct. Correct. Right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. Of course, it's that you don't want to put yourself in a situation. But you know, I was telling people the other day. You know, and and I'm one of these people that study a lot concerning the uh, the Jewish feast. And how they relate to the Bible itself and how they are the blueprint that God has left for us concerning the scriptures, concerning the beginning of time towards the ending of time itself. And, um, and I was saying that, you know, we just got done you know, celebrating Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, uh, the month of Elul, you know, and uh, if you think about it, we're kind of like in a spiritual month of Elul from the time of the crucifixion until now. God has given us all this time for us to teshuva to return back to him, you know? And uh, the, the main thing here is, like you were saying before, the coming of the Messiah, this is, this is both an agreement with the Messianic Jews say and both the Orthodox say, that it does require for people to teshuva, for his people to teshuva. And one of the main things that can bring in, you know, can usher in the coming of the Moshiach. Yeah. You know? And there's, um, let me, let, there's another concept here that is not understood within Christianity at all, mm-hmm. that is very important in understanding how this system works, is the, under, is, is the concept of zikhut, of merit. Yes. Um, the way merit works is if somebody does a mitzvah, if somebody fulfills a commandment of God, Merit is gained. 
Mm -hmm. And here's where the misunderstanding comes. If I do a mitzvah, I don't get the merit. Mm -hmm. Israel gets the merit. Mm -hmm. If you do a mitzvah, you don't get the merit. I don't get the merit. Israel gets the merit. That's right. Okay. So the concept is when the allotted amount of merit is built up within Israel, that's when Mashiach comes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's going to be happening in the outside surrounding world is sort of a different question. Right. Right. If uh, things are going really well and the world makes teshuva, right, and the world starts doing mitzvot, people start doing mitzvot all over the place, then the Mashiach can come and a lot of these negative prophecies don't necessarily come true. Mm -hmm. Because just like Nineveh, the world is made to Shuba. That's right. That's right. Or, or the world can be horrible, terrible. All of these negative prophecies can come true. But there's enough people that have done enough mitzvot that this level of mitzvot, of zichut, has been gained within Israel and Mashiach comes. That's right. That's right. So either things are going to be really, really good. Or things are going to be really, really bad, and then Mashiach is going to come. Amen, amen. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I was reading, and uh, according to the Orthodox Jews, you know, they believe that, as you were saying, um, the things that can bring the Mashiach one is a special mitzvot, a teshuvah. Um, they also believe that if we're watchmen, that can also usher in the coming of the Mashiach sooner. They also talk about if you keep the Shabbat, if you will keep the Shabbat properly, that would also um, offered in the coming of the Mashiach much quicker, what they believe. Torah study is another one. Uh, Zedaka and um, unity of Israel. These are all the things, and this is all coming from the, the Lubavitch group. This is what they believe concerning the coming of the Mashiach. Yeah, and I would I would separate them from Orthodox. Yes, yes. I would separate them from the, the rest of the Hasidic movement also. Mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. You know, it, you go to Israel and the, the and you talk to the, the Hasidim there, and most of them kind of snicker when you mention the, the Chabad. They are not considered mainstream amongst the uh, uh, correct uh, Hasidic groups at all. Correct. But the interesting thing about all of those that you listed was that it's all about mitzvah. Yes. All of them. Being a watchman, keeping uh -huh. Shabbat. Uh -huh. All of these things are about mitzvot. Uh -huh. It's exactly the same thing that Peter was saying. That's right. That's right. And that's why I was saying that looking at in, in, in Orthodox Judaism, we're looking at this particular group within Orthodox uh, Judaism. You find a lot of things that they say concerning the Moshiach and stuff like that. Very interesting because a lot of it, you can see some of that. And the Riha the shines and, and and some of the things that we say today, not everything, but there are some things that we can agree upon um, and things they say. But it's very interesting how they, they think about this. And there's actually there's a, there's a book which they have which concerns the um we want Moshiach now. And they talk about all this stuff in there, you know. It's very interesting. Um, as you know, that you know, we we've seen this a lot now in Israel. We see a lot of and not just them, but other Orthodox groups are claiming the Messiah to come now. You know, it seems like the whole world is, is proclaiming the Messiah to come. The question is here, which Messiah is coming? You know, is it the one that we await or is it the one that we know as the anti-Messiah that will come uh, to deceive the world? And, uh, we, you know, we have to look at both I have thoughts on that as well. What was that? I have thoughts on that as well. Yeah. I, I think the anti-Messiah is here. Oh, yes, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, and I would look, I look, um, you know, having no, lived in, in Yerushalayim for a while, you can't get away from that golden dome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You look at it and, and you know what should be there. Yes. And uh, uh, it, Islam occupies it. Mm -hmm. I think that Islam fulfills all of the requirements for being the anti Messiah. Mm, interesting. Right now, it's here. We are living literally under the anti Messiah. So, do you, the worldwide influence. Do you believe it's then more of an organization than an individual? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no doubt. Okay. Yeah, so, a bunch of individuals. So, do you believe that because 
if the anti Mashiach is here, for example, you know, even though you and I may differ in this topic, but if the anti Mashiach is here, um, I believe that as well in a different perspective than you do. But if the anti Mashiach is here, and uh, there's really not that much left concerning uh, biblical eschatology or prophecy for it to be fulfilled for Yeshua's return, is there? Um, yes and no. Again, everything depends on us. Right? Right. We're in partnership with Hashem. At this That's point. right. That's right. If, if, if we start doing more mitzvot, if we mm-hmm. promote more mitzvot, we get people to start doing more mitzvot, including Shabbat, including um, treating each other well. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we got to look at things like Facebook and look, it, suddenly you can right. anonymously behave horribly. Yeah. And this is, this is a step in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. So how do we get people to step in the right direction, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, how do we reach over? So, if, if we can can get these things together, yeah, Mashiach will come. Amen. Mashiach will come. Now, is there, by your knowledge, any scriptural reference to this that we can more or less base ourselves on and concerning the coming of Mashiach in this particular manner? Uh, what about the mitzvot? Uh, well, about yeah. Well, we're what we're talking about now about how we we can hasten the coming of Moshiach. You know. Well, yeah. I mean, I just Second uh, uh, Peter three eleven and twelve. That's a big one. Mm-hmm. Also, the attitudes of of all of the people involved. You know, Yeshua, right. Yeshua's entire ministry was not about his death. Mm-hmm. Yeshua's ministry is about his life. That's right. And Yeshua is constantly telling people to turn to God. Right? Return to God. Right. Basically, he's telling them to do mitzvot because he's talking to a bunch of Jews. Mm-hmm. And that's how Jews return to God. How do you return to God? How do you make Yeshua? You do mitzvot. Yeah. yeah. To the point where Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Everybody wants to focus on the miracle of the mm-hmm. tongues. Mm-hmm. But that's not the important part of the chapter. Mm-hmm. No, the important part of the chapter is Peter's soliloquy at the end. And Peter goes through the litany. Says, Here it is. Yeshua is our Messiah. That's and right. you missed it. Mm-hmm. And then they, they stop. You know, you got to picture the million people that are there at Har Habayit on Shavuot. Wow. Right. A million people. Physically impossible to cram that many people into that small space. This is a, a, a miraculous uh, occurrence of something with the intersection of, of beyond time and space in the Temple Mount. Amen. It's really amazing. And Peter goes through all of this and they go, oh, no, what have we done? Mm-hmm. What have we done? What do we do? We. Mashiach was here and we killed we killed him. Yeah. Wow. What do we do? What does he say? Shuv mechata, turn from sin. Shuv Latonai. Turn to God. That's right. He says, do exactly what we're talking about doing. Mm-hmm. That's the answer. Amen. The entire purpose <clears throat> of Yeshua's coming here for the world is to get the world to do mitzvot. Amen. Amen. And Who's the Israel being the light to the world? Mm-hmm. Right? right? Israel being Mamlechet Kohanim, being the, the kingdom of priests. That's right. Right? To who? To everybody else. I mean, <laughs> we, we, we see this. And one of the most interesting things I find is that a lot of times you hear, like, for example, um, I have a friend of mine that, that used to be the uh, director of the um, Institute in, in Temple Institute in, um, in Jerusalem. Rabbi Chaim Richmond, and Rabbi Chaim Richmond, he's always talking about, you know, that uh, the main thing is about getting the temple built. They believe, they strongly believe if the temple is built, it will bring this world peace and harmony, would draw all men unto Hashem, you know, and the whole world would change. Um, It will bring forth the coming of Moshiach. That's what a lot of, you know, them believe. Um, You know, and, and you see this today, you see this belief 
system. You know, everything is already there. They already have all the money uh, acquired to to build the temple. They have all the vessels built. They have everything. As a matter of fact, uh, another friend of mine is also involved in in the material and building, not the material, but the um, for the clothing to reconstruct the clothing. Um, uh, Ruin Prager, a uh, friend of mine, from, you know, he's, he's done that. And uh, this is already done. It's already there. So the only thing they would need is to get that Dome of the Rock out of its place for them to build the temple. Or some believe that, no, you don't have to touch that. It could be next to it. You know, but then again, then there's, there's a problem there with not being, it'll defile the Temple Mount. Anyway, there's another discussion there. But, um, you know, the whole thing about it is everyone is looking towards this temple being built as a sign. Both believers. Well, we can't believers. fulfill the mitzvah without the temple. Of course. You can fulfill some, but you got to have it there in order to, right? And and to get that going, really, we need the para duma, and we don't have that. Yes, there. yeah. Or we could somehow find the ashes of the original para duma, which, you know, we don't know. We don't know if the well, ashes are hidden. Water and that's, that's gone. Right, right. So there's a whole, you know, we've had very close calls every year concerning the para duma. You know that we never know. It seems like every year there's right. there's more problems. This up. is this is another one of those things. It's another mm-hmm. step, right? When, mm-hmm. when we get that, it will be that much closer. But that's right. That's right. You know, and then there's uh, we had a discussion recently with another rabbi in a program. We were talking about Moshiach ben Yosef, Moshiach ben David, and how the Messiah, those two messiahs fulfill the prophecy, or how also the Orthodox community sees, you know, the two messiahs. You know, and we do know that within the Orthodox community, Moshiach ben, uh, ben Yosef was the one that was going to be rebuilding the temple or starting off rebuilding the temple. Um, but the same token, that Moshiach was supposed to die. Um, and we see this with Yeshua. We see that Yeshua was fulfilling both roles in this. And that it's very interesting to see this because um, uh, you don't hear too much about this in the Messianic community being talked about. Mm-hmm. Moshiach ben Yosef? No, no, Moshiach ben Yosef, yes, but not so much in the details about everything about concerning Moshiach ben Yosef and how it relates to, to today and, and stuff like that. You hear some Bible studies concerning, you know, relationship between Yeshua and who they both are, how he fulfills both roles. But you really don't hear the, the, the orthodox perspective of who Yeshua uh, ben Yosef was. You hear more about the right. Messianic, but not the other way around. Right. And actually, you know, you look at them both and... It, it, in well, their there's, own a lot, there's a lot, there's a huge maslota. Yes. Within within the Orthodox community about Mashiach ben Yosef and, mm-hmm. and uh, who he is and what he's supposed to be. You know, is he the one that builds the temple? Mm-hmm. Is he one that uh, um, uh, politically is, is assassinated? You know, is he... Uh, simultaneous says the uh, Meshach ben David mm-hmm. is he precede the Meshach ben David? Mm-hmm. They're all over the board with it, depending on the group you talk to. Correct. So one Correct. one one of the reasons that we don't hear about it much is because uh, there's there's absolutely no consensus. Yeah. Amongst yeah. The, w- within within Judaism about Meshach ben Yosef, other than yeah, he exists. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing if you if you're studying the Midrash. And you read the Midrash, different concept, different thoughts that different rabbis comment in the Midrash. You start seeing difference of opinion over the place. The same thing, you know, um, basically, you know, what, what I try to do is when I look at these things, I pick out those things which are, you know, that, that, that show kind of like something is happening today, you know, to show you what the belief system was at that time concerning this particular topic, you know. Because there are topics that we should study more and learn more about. So one of the things also was a lot of times people or, or the Orthodox community refer to Isaiah 60, uh, uh, chapter 60, which refers to the Messiah, talks about the Moshiach and uh, his coming. So in that particular verse is interesting because in that particular verse talks about time, how God can hasten his time for returning. You know, and they look at that saying, well, it doesn't necessarily say that he's going to change the time, but it kind of like contradicts itself in a way that it says that he might change his time, depending what's happening in the world, you know? Um, and again, for, if we're, we're taking God's perspective beyond time correct, and space, correct. the whole thing of changing time really doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Right? Correct. Correct. Because God has his time set and whatever his time set is going to happen regardless, because he lives outside time and space. And that may be different than we thought before. I can't you know, doesn't matter <laughs> yeah 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 well the interesting part here i want to read this because it's interesting here it says 
It says here, um, even so the wording in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 22, seems to display a contradiction by stating, in its time, I will hasten it. It is time means a set date. I will hasten it means it would occur earlier. Before its time, the contradiction is resolved as follows. If they are worthy, I will hasten it. If not, it's in its time. So this is what they're saying. This is how they explain right. that particular That's verse. the whole idea of Zichut, right? That's right. Merit. That's right. That's right. So it's very interesting, you know, concerning this topic, because you hear a lot of people say this, you know, and, I, and I've heard this a lot more now, not just within the Lubavitch group, but I've heard it a lot within the Orthodox community, because I'm always looking into things and what's going on in the world, that they're always saying, we can make Moshiach come now. We can make Moshiach come now, you know? And this is something that you hear a lot. You know, you don't hear it too much within the Messianic community, but you do hear a lot outside of that. Right. Well, um, within the yeshiva, within yeshiva chubu, it's one of the things that we study uh, fairly extensively is not only the meaning of this, but is a practical method how do we actually get it to, to, to come about? You know, mm. th th there is a, a, a uh, tendency to look at all of this stuff uh, theoretically. Yes. And not get down to the pragmatic end of it. And the pragmatic end of it, interestingly enough, is what Yeshua Mashiach is all about. Mm -hmm. Right? Love God and love your neighbor. That's right. The whole Torah hangs on these things. That's right. Right? So how? Right? Can this happen? Well, yeah, we have inklings within the text that, mm -hmm. that yes, we mm -hmm. can we can we can hasten. So what do we do? Right. So we do mitzvot. Mm -hmm. You know, and then what does Yeshua command us to do? He says you're to go to the nations and Teach them right. everything I've commanded you. That's right. The commandments, the mitzvot. That's right. Right? So we, 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 we get this every time we try to get away from it. Every time we try to get distracted. Mm -hmm. Every time we start going out here into the universe, we also have this pulling us down. That's right. Right? And it's not only Yeshua, it's every one of the prophets. That's right. Right, it's the wisest among us. It's Solomon. It's uh, David in the Psalms. You can't get away from it. The whole thing is, you don't have to be baller. It's a good thing to be brilliant or a scholar. That's right. But you don't have to be. What do you have right. to do? You have to do another mitzvah. That's right. Right. What would the Orthodox talk about? You know, Shabbat. So we do two Shabbatot. No, if all of Israel does two Shabbatot in a row. Mm -hmm. Right, it, they truly do it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what does this mean? You know, you take a little bit broader look at it in order for everything to set up for all of Israel to do two Shabbatot in a row correctly, mm -hmm. they really got to be following virtually all the other mitzvah. That's right, that's right. And that, and we're back to the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. we can study, we can guess when is Yeshua coming? Mm -hmm. Is he coming sooner? Is he coming later? Is he coming tomorrow? Is he coming in a thousand years? And the answer is the same. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Do another mitzvah. That's right. You know, my beautiful bride, Roni, she says, she tells me all the time, she says, look, behave as if Yeshua isn't coming for another thousand years or if Yeshua is coming tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Your behavior shouldn't change. No, it should be consistent because you should be the same. Where you serve it should be the same because you're following God, you're loving God right. and loving your neighbor, and that's it. Well, if you look at it, you know, when we do our, our Parsha every week, we read the Parsha every week. Every Parsha is kind of like tell us to follow God's ordinance, his commandments. It's, 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 oh, it's telling us and telling us and telling us about this, you know. So God wants us to focus on his word. To live, like you said, you know, like if he was coming tomorrow or a thousand years, it doesn't matter. We should be fulfilling God's word. And I think with this, you're, we're seeing more and more Gentile believers. Yes, isn't that a surprise? Yes, that all of a sudden now want to know about the Jewish holidays, Shabbat, you know, they want to learn about the Torah, they want to learn about all these things. Too many you find of them, them. Are, are trying to say that we're wrong about it. But that's yes, that's story. true. That's a different story. That's a different group. <laughs> but the ones that are sincere... The ones that are sincere, you see them, they have that hunger to learn. And we're beginning to see a change 
in the nations concerning when it comes to Judaism and how they want to hold on to it and hold on to God's word. Well, this is this is why Yeshiva Shuvu uh, was created. Mm-hmm. Was one of the problems, and you're very familiar with this, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. One of the problems of the Messianic Judaism is a complete lack of education. Yes. We, we, we just have way too many people that just don't know stuff. So uh, Yeshiva Shuvu was created seven, eight years, going on eight years ago mm-hmm. uh, by uh, Rav Yitzchak Shapira. And uh, I came on board with him right at the beginning. And it was created to give people that desired it uh, a, a place to go for the education, Amen. to be able to, to be able to learn to be able to learn uh, uh, Jewish history, Jewish theological concepts, Hebrew, beginnings of Aramaic, uh, what the implications are as far as prophecy is concerned, and all of that. And we have grown to become the largest um, uh, Messianic yeshiva in the world. We have, um, we're approaching a thousand students worldwide right now that are enrolled in actually uh, taking courses. We have live stuff that we do. I was telling you, uh, Sunday morning, I uh-huh. have a, 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 a live teaching that we do uh, on this next week's Parsha. Uh, and and uh, just just tons of other stuff. And anybody can join. And we have lots of Gentiles. And this is a surprise. Lots of Gentiles that are coming in that want to know. They want to learn. They want to under, understand. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're coming in to join in the yeshiva. Yes, and, and that's very important because we see this. This is also a sign that we're towards those end times, you know. And, you know, one of the things that I see in my own congregation, I see a lot of Gentiles that are coming and saying, you know, we have a hunger to know the truth, to know the Jewish Messiah. Because obviously he's different from the other Messiah, which we know, you know, and then when they start learning and start seeing all these customs within Judaism and how they, you know, how they reflect in, in the Shai and Yeshua's time. So they begin to realize, say, wait a minute, we've been missing out all these years on all these beautiful things that God's been trying to tell us. Yes. At the same time, I want to caution everybody mm-hmm. against wagging the finger at, the, at Christianity. Yes. Right. And especially this season, we got Christmas coming up mm-hmm. you know? in, in North America. It's unavoidable. It's here. It's, right. It's in Israel, it's, you can almost ignore it. But <laughs> here it's been. And it's not a bad thing. Right. If you look at the millions and millions of people through history that have come to faith because of Christianity, because of Christian mm-hmm. te- teachings, because of Christian festivals and whatnot, mm-hmm. this is all part of God's plan. Mm-hmm. It's all part of God's plan. And if going through that to then turn and come to understand the, the Judaic origins of the ideas and, and maybe change your mind, but this is how it works. Mm-hmm. This is how it's been working. We can oh, see yeah, God, God, God opens up, the, you know, he, he starts, he, he lays the breadcrumbs out and people just follow, you know, and that door opens up other doors, you know, to learn more about him. Right, Tractate Chagiga in the uh, above, in the, mm-hmm. the, the Talmud. Uh, it says, if your father sins, don't say, Father, you are sinning. Right. Say instead, Father, this is what Torah says. That's right. Right. So even when we know that people are not doing right, not understanding right, or, this is something we need to definitely educate, but not judge. Correct. And there's a huge difference. And yeah. it all comes from the heart. Yeah. And I see a lot of this, you know, you see, unfortunately, in, in the media, you do see a lot of people that are not necessarily Jewish people that are that are attacking is mostly other people outside of Judaism that are attacking uh, Gentiles and their faith and Christianity and stuff oh, like that. Oh, it, it, it's it's reform smoker syndrome. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah that nobody, nobody is anti-smoking as much as somebody who used to smoke. Correct, correct. <laughs> 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 you know, we, we see this a lot. And unfortunately, you know, one of the things that, you know, we have to be careful with because, you know, they are, you know, they are brothers um, in Christ and in, in oh, yeah. with us, you know, we have to love them. And of course, you know, you know, God is opening eyes all over the place, you know, concerning certain things and practices, but we can't be so judgmental because what we're doing, instead of bringing them to Moshiach, we're casting you them drive out. them away. Yeah. Sure. 
yeah. we do the same thing with the with the uh, non-believing Jewish community. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. Right. And we have to be very careful with that as well. And I'm very, you know, I'm a person that speaks up against that. I'm never, I'll never throw the book at people and stuff like that and judge them and that concerning, you know, I'll let the word of God talk to them, you know, instruct them. And, and let them see Messiah in you. Yeah, definitely. Right. We are his you testimony. Know, the, the love comes through. That's right. That's right. And I always say here every Shabbat, you know, I say we should have, you know, his word, you know, inside of us, you know, his ned tamid should be in our hearts. And if his ned tamid is in our hearts, it will shine from, from outside of us. And everyone will know that we are his tamadim. By looking at it, by seeing his light radiate from us, they will know that we are his disciples and they will follow him. There's a, there's a very interesting portion in Shira Shirim Rabba, right? The Midrash on, on the mm-hmm. Song of Psalms mm-hmm. that uh, is describing um, the light in the temple. Yes. Right inside the temple building. Now the, the walls are because they didn't have uh, rebar and uh, you know, mm-hmm. so so the walls had to be pretty thick. Yeah. Right. They're they're you know eight ten feet thick at the, at the and they have to be much thicker at the bottom than at the top. Right. But also, if there is light, you you, you build windows to, to to put light into a building. Mm-hmm. So you build a house or you build a two or three story building. And you have these really wide pane uh, uh, windows. They're wide on the outside. On the inside, they're they're not as wide. Right. And the whole idea is that the light on the outside has the best chance to get in. You know, as the sun moves, mm-hmm. you, you get. To, but in the temple, the windows were wide on the inside. And narrow on the outside. Midrash right. explains to us so that this allowed the most amount of light to come mm-hmm. out from the temple into mm-hmm. the world, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? And so, if we are to be the light into the nations, right? Th- this is this is everything that we're talking about. That's right. They need to see the light, and where do they see the light? It's not with banging people in the head with a book. No. no. It's yeah. with the love. It's with the ner tamid within us. That's right. That's right. So they see us. They see they see his ner tamid, his light inside of us. They see his character in us, his love, his rachem in us. They will follow. But if we show them everything against, you know, we speak against and we judge them all the time. And, and instead of bringing them closer to Moshiach, but further away, they'll never get to know who Moshiach truly is. Because we pretty much push them away. Throw on top of this education. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Throw on top of this more and more <laughs> understanding of who Yeshua was, yes. the times that he lived in, yes. who he was speaking to, what he meant, how people around him understood the things that he said. Yes. All of those things. So we could put Yeshua in the proper milieu and, and his disciples in the proper milieu. Then we get to understand the teachings and allow the light to come out even more. Amen. Amen. Well, Rabbi Bernstein, thank you so much for today. Um, as we fin- we're finishing this show, coming to the end of this program, which kind of ends pretty quickly, you know, unfortunately, um, <laughs> do you have anything you would like to share with our viewers? Yes. Uh, and it's kind of the, the, the topic that Rav David and I were just speaking of. You can get caught up in a lot of the searching for when exactly Yeshua is going to come, what the nature of the end times is going to be, all of these things. But and, and it's fine and it's interesting. But it doesn't help us lead holy and godly lives. It doesn't hasten the coming of Yeshua. What hastens the coming of Yeshua is the doing of these commandments. Mm-hmm. It's letting people see the love in us loving our neighbor as ourselves it is in keeping shabbat holy amen right it is in celebrating the moed as it comes you know we just finished sukkot mm-hmm. uh, i've got a stack of etrogim on my dining room table i'm going to cut up and make candied etrog peels so we can eat on tubishva it's uh, doing things like that mm-hmm. right to help mm-hmm. connect the cycles of time that 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 Hashem uh, gives us. It's in understanding and doing things that people are not used to doing. Things like mikvah. Yes. Go and do a mikvah. Go, you know, 
I'm mm-hmm. in Florida. We got water everywhere. You can go and make <laughs> <laughs> right. Pennsylvania, oh, not so sure, but no, we, we do. We schedule ours every year on the same time, and every year we have a blessing. We have a lot of people that come out. It's awesome. I mean, that's great. So do these things. Do the pragmatic. Do the practical. Keep it simple. Amen. Amen. Rabbi Bernstein, please tell us where people can support your ministry by donations and find you on the web. Please tell us any uh, your social media outlets that you may have. Okay. Yeah, we're on uh, Facebook, uh, and it's uh, with the name of the synagogue, which is Edat Haderech, which means uh, Congregation of the Way. Amen. And it's A-Y-D-A-T-H-A-D-E-R ekh.com and it's also a dot had there on facebook uh, my messages are uh, uh, recorded on facebook live uh, every shabbat so you can just go to the to the facebook page and see them i uh, also like to say if anybody's interested in further education go to uh, shuvu.tv that's s-h-u-v-u dot tv and you can learn about the yeshiva amen, amen. Thank you so much, Brother Ron. We want to thank you so much for coming to the show and sharing this insightful topic with us. Can we hasten the coming of Moshiach? Uh, Rabbi Dr. Bernstein, um, will you definitely will have you come back again and share more with us because it's very interesting, you know, um, this topic and other things. I'm sure you have a lot more to teach uh, concerning the Messiah himself. Amen. Please support this ministry by going to our webpage, bethymanuel.org. You can send your donations there. Please indicate on PayPal that it's for walking the footsteps of the Moshiach. If you'd like to write to us to ask a biblical question for us or any of our guests have been on the show, you can write to us at congregationbethymanuelphila at gmail.com. And again, we want to thank um, Dr. Bernstein for joining us today. And uh, he's been such a, a gracious guest. And uh, we're definitely going to visit you out there in space, out there. <laughs> In my honor. Oh, man, oh, man. Thank you so much. And again, we'll continue to pray for you and for your ministry. I mean, the Lord truly bless you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Shavuot Amen. Shavuot Shalom, everyone.